All right, we are back. Time for some more answers to questions. Now here's one, um, looks like two different things here. Brian060815 uh, had a question here and then obviously went up here and asked another little part of it. So I'll do the first one first and then second. Um, Romans 11.22 when it says, If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Could this be a reference to the apostasy at the end of the church age and the Lord going back to Israel and the gospel no longer being faith alone? Um, I know this is a verse that a lot of people give you a hard time with, even though you are be just being honest. Well, thank you. I appreciate that you understand. Thank you for your ministry. It has been a real blessing to my wife and I. Um, you know, I do appreciate that, that there are some people out there that just understand that I'm being honest. As you've seen in this study, um, I don't always have answers to the questions. Some of them, yeah, the Lord gives me insight and I can answer it and praise the Lord for that. Other times I just, I do my best, okay? Um, when it says there in Romans chapter 11, verse 22, of course, turn, your, turn there in your King James Bible. Um, otherwise thou, shalt, thou also shalt be cut off. Could this be a reference to reference to the apostasy at the end of the church age and the Lord going back to Israel and the gospel no longer being faith alone. And of course, if you're new to this and you don't quite understand what he's saying there, um, the gospel in the time of Jacob's trouble is not the same gospel that we have. I mean, Jesus is still there. You know, Jesus is being preached. Re Revelation 14 verse 12 talks about faith of Jesus, the faith of Jesus and keeping the commandments. So, uh, there's the mark of the beast in the time of Jacob's trouble. It isn't going to be a simple thing as just faith alone and you're sealed with, un, with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Things change. But uh, Romans 11 verse 22 uh, says, What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known? I'm sorry, nope, that's chapter 9. Never mind. Uh, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Now, uh, there's different ways to interpret that. Uh, one is that the cut off there would be that you're cut off from millennial in inheritance. Jesus denies you millennial inheritance because you've gone against the Jewish people. If you go against the Jewish people, you're really kind of going against the Lord because the Lord is a Jew. Salvation is of the Jews. And he's going to be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. It's kind of funny because if replacement theology has happened and the nation of Israel, Israel is no more, then why are they the center of Bible prophecy in the end times? Why are the two witnesses coming back to witness in the streets of Jerusalem? Kind of an odd thing. Why does Jesus set up his kingdom in Jerusalem if the Jews have been totally cut off? Uh, so you could say, well, Jesus is denying you're being cut off from millennial inheritance. Um, but what it's saying there is, in context, it's talking about salvation. That the Jews, you know, are there, they're cut off as a people, and you're to, you know, take heed, and uh, lest you're also cut off. So it's just, a, you know, it's one of them things that I, I just say, it's very dangerous to mess around with that thing of replacement theology. Um, it's a teaching of the Catholic Church. That's why I stay away from it. Uh, but definitely there is the apostasy at the end of the church age. Um, you know, I think a lot of the people that are falling for replacement theology are not saved. Uh, they're Catholic and things like this. And if you want to make the Lord angry, um, Start saying that the Jews are no more and, and hating on the Jews and say it's a Jew world order and all these other stupid nonsense things. Um, you know, I think it is a definite part of the end time apostasy. And uh, I think that those people there that are teaching and believing in replacement theology are, um, most of them, I would say, are definitely not saved. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult passage of Scripture, and I just try to go with what the text says, and I don't try to cover up things and whatever else. I just try to be honest with it. Another question up here above it is, one more quick question. Have you heard of Sam Gipps, or Sam Gipps' take on the rapture about how the dead in Christ might walk the earth for some time before we are called up? I'm not real sure about this because it seems like it would be a sign and we are to live by faith. Uh, exactly. 
I mean, uh, the Bible gives no grounds for this. It's in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Um, you know, the when the trump of God sounds, the dead in Christ go up. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. It doesn't say that you know it's a kind of a long thing and and you know well they they're kind of they come up and they're on the earth and then all of us go up at the same time you know eh. you know it's it's a nice little theory and whatever else kind of a, a wonder what if but I don't see any real scripture for it so I tend to just stay away from that honestly okay next we have Jesus is the Lord I have a quick question I don't understand about the thing about letting 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 7 and 8 to what point can letting go um, because on one sense we are supposed to let evil but on the other it was prophesied that these things would happen beforehand okay I think the thing that he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way is 2 Thessalonians I know it's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 let's see what verses we're talking about here yeah for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now the question is, don't understand about the thing of, of about letting, hindering there in that passage. To what point can letting go because in one sense we are supposed to let evil hinder evil but on the other it was prophesied that these things okay I see what you're saying you're saying in other words um, the body of Christ can't continue to hinder the Antichrist because this stuff is prophesied I'll show you an uh, interesting tie in verse as far as you know a lot of people will say well you know we're still here because you know we're going to be here till the last soul is saved as far as you know getting out there and it's a drum roll to witness to people and stuff like that. And I, I do teach that, but it's it's not that the Lord's just somehow putting off um, everything, you know, and, and it's up to the body of Christ to do certain work, and then the Lord will make things happen after that. Uh, no, God has everything preset. Uh, we don't know that timing, but it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, Trying to think of where the passage is here in Revelation. Okay, Revelation chapter 9. It says here, And the four angels, verse 15, Revelation 9, 15. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. So if the time of Jacob's trouble is being held off till the last Christian does his job of winning souls or something, uh, that kind of makes a problem. Because you see, uh, if it had happened, you know, there's a popular thing going around that, well, it could have happened at any time in the past. No, it couldn't have. Because of that verse right there. You're not going to have the rapture and then another 1,500 years before the time of Jacob's trouble. That's not going to happen. Um, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. All right? And the Lord has this stuff all timed out. The Lord knows the day of the rapture. It's not some mysterious thing and whatever else. And um, he has everything worked out, believe you me. But the thing of how can we be there, you know, we're letting, in other words, hindering, we're stopping that Antichrist from showing up, um, but yet he's going to show up, you know. So um, some people struggle with that, and they say, "Well, okay, if we're he's supposed to show up, then why are we hindering him from showing up?" You know. Uh, well, that's our job. And notice it doesn't say um, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That's the spirit of antichrist. Only he who now letteth will let until he no longer feels like letting anymore. Until he just says, well, forget it, let's just go and compromise and whatever. It's not what it says. Until he be taken out of the way. Our job as Christians is to say, yes, the world is going to get worse. Um, we can't be deceived into saying, you know, I, you know, someday when my grandchildren sit on my lap, I can talk. No, I'm not going to have grandchildren. Okay, that time period of the time of Jacob's trouble is in our generation. That's coming very rapidly, which means the rapture is going to happen before that. So I can't say... We can't 
act kooky and say, well, someday we'll have grandchildren or great-grandchildren and we'll remember. And whatever. That's not there. Our job, though, as Christians is to let, to hinder the system of Antichrist, to warn people, to sound the alarm. That thing there is the mark of the beast. Uh, this is the New World Order system. This is prophecy being fulfilled. That's our job. All right, we don't just say, well... If you can't fight them, join them, you know? I mean, if you can't beat them, join them or something. No, 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 no. Um, we don't go to Walmart. Okay, we will not shop at Walmart. Uh, why? They've destroyed America. You say, well, America's supposed to be destroyed. Yes, I know that, but it's never right to do wrong. All right, what, America, what Walmart has done to this country, um, it's, it's just been terrible. And you say, well, it's supposed to be, it's prophesied and all this other stuff. Yeah, but I'm not going to help the system come in. You know, when we get raptured away, we should be a peculiar people. We should be a different people that the world says, I remember that guy I worked with. Yeah, he, he didn't go to Walmart and he didn't have a cell phone and stuff because he's saying about being tracked and you haven't had to have a number and all this other stuff and whatever else. And there's a whole lot with cell phones. I mean, pe some people, oh, you know, whatever. Uh, they put off electrical fields and things like that, give you cancer. I mean, it, good night, people. Do some research on it, please. All right, don't just don't just laugh at me and say, oh, you're kooky and whatever else. I used to have a track phone. It wasn't a full cell phone and whatever else. My wife had cell phones. She's worked in the industry. We can tell you all kinds of stories about it, but do the research. Do the research. They're very, very bad for your health. The NSA is tracking you. They can, you know, whatever. Bad news. Get away from cell phones, but... The point is, we as Christians, our job is to preach the gospel to the lost, but it's also our job to hinder the Antichrist, to let that mystery of iniquity. When the Vatican does something, they call for you know ecumenical peace. We should be the first ones online saying the Vatican's calling for a one-world religion. You know, the president comes out and says, "I think that uh, we should look towards the global future." He's calling for a new world order. We should, we should be the first ones on the firing line to say, they're trying to bring in this one world government. This is the system of Antichrist. We should be the first ones out there on the firing line, spiritually speaking, of course. You know, that's what's going on there. Yes, these things are coming. You know, I mean, uh, another verse of scripture here. I'm going to have to look this up quick. I'm trying to think of where it's at. Um... Okay, Matthew chapter 18, verse 7 says, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. In other words, Jesus is saying offenses are coming. This end of the world stuff and, and everything else, it's coming. But woe to the man by whom, that, or whom the offense cometh. Don't help the system to come in. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question. Okay, question. The truth will set you free. Okay, question. Uh, brother, what do you think Stephen Anderson is? Number one, a foolish virgin from Matthew 25, or number two, a Catholic Jesuit according to the KJV Bible? Okay, well, um, I don't think he's a foolish virgin. Uh, you know, the, the, as far as the foolish virgins are concerned, that's people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, the The... Foolish virgins, if you don't know what that, what this person is talking about, if you're new to this. Matthew chapter 25, turn there in your King James Bible. Matthew 25, um, then shall the king, verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. These are people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, that's, a, that's what this is in reference to, the kingdom of heaven. It's the, a reference to the millennial physical kingdom. It is not a reference to the body of Christ. And uh, what you have there, they're going forth to meet the bridegroom, not marry him. The body of Christ right now, if you're a Christian, you will be married to Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 19. And so we're not going to meet the bridegroom. We're going to marry the bridegroom. But it gets worse than that. Um, if you jump down to verse 8, it says, And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Now, most commentators will tell you that that oil in the lamp is a type of the Holy Spirit. 
uh, okay, if that's true for the whole for the for a Christian, how do you buy the Holy Spirit? You know, it's kind of interesting because the guy in the Book of Acts, he actually comes up to the uh, apostles and he says he sees this power that they're laying hands on the sick and they're recovering and giving tongues and stuff and he goes I'd like to buy that he offers him money and Peter turns to him and he says thy money perish with thee but I thought you could buy the Holy Spirit here in this passage it's not the same thing it's not what's going on so Stephen Anderson is not a foolish virgin from Matthew 25 uh, quite frankly I don't think he's going to make it through the Tom and Jacob's trouble um, I think he's a little government stooge. Uh, I, see, I, I think a lot of these guys, what they are, is they go off to some seminary somewhere and they get called in to the office and they're presented with some things. Hey, we really like what you're doing. We really believe in what you're doing. And Hey, we just like to talk to you. We have some pe people we'd like you to meet and whatever else. I had that offered to me. I don't really talk about that very much, but at one of the Baptist churches I was going to, I got called into the office and ask some questions and things. Mm -hmm. But you see, I've always been very, uh, when the Lord saved me, uh, I decided to sell out very early in terms of defending the King James Bible. And uh, I'm not going to back down from anybody on that issue. Um, this is God's book, this King James Bible. So, um, do I believe that uh, Stephen Anderson is a Catholic Jesuit? Well, uh, there's a, the, the proper term would be a temporal coadjutor. In other words, they help. He's not a priest, an open priest, not yet. But they help out the Catholic Church through on the temporal plane, not the spiritual, but the temporal. In other words, the uh, non-Catholic related secular world. And I think his, his uh, purpose, his mission is to bring Roman Catholic theology, Roman Catholic teachings of replacement theology, post-tribism, um, some of the other things, easy believism, and things like that, false gospel, in other words. Um, and America is Babylon now, not the Roman Catholic Church. And bring all these things in as under the veil of Baptist teaching. So, he's a fraud. So, um, Back and forth there, but we're going to continue. Dan, KJV 1611. Is it biblical to be patriotic as long as I put God and His Word first? When I say patriotic, I don't mean things like voting. Thank you, brother, for the work you do. Your ministry, ministry has been a true blessing. You, and your, you, your family, and your ministry are always in my prayers. God bless and Maranatha. Um, amen. Looking forward to the Lord's coming. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Because then we don't have to worry about these questions. He'll show us what to believe. We will know even as we are also known. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about that. But what about being patriotic? Well, Romans chapter 13 says, verse 1, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Hmm. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. I had that confrontation with these devil worshippers over here, this satanic Babel building, and they called the police on me. I was trying to call the police on them, and it didn't work until they actually called the police on me. So that, that worked out much better. <laughs> I'm thankful. <laughs> but uh, the police officer I dealt with, uh, Trooper Dennis Quint, uh, when he showed up, you know, he was definitely, I mean, I can tell when a police officer is, um, the level of force is ready to go. I mean, he's ready for a confrontation. You know, they told him things probably that I was threatening, and he was like, you know, you, you've been saying incendiary, incendiary things and stuff like this, and it's just like, and he saw very quickly I was not a threat. 
and I mean, he came up, he was tense, he was, I mean, I could tell this guy's ready to fight, you know, and it was just like, I told him, I was like, I was just like, sir, and I was respectful to him, and by the end of the thing, we were shaking hands, and I said, you know what, the Bible says that you are God's minister. Your job is to enforce the secular laws. I am a minister of Jesus Christ. My job is to preach the Bible, preach the Word of God. And I said, what these people are doing is wicked. It's wrong. I stand for quiet communities where people respect one another. They have no respect for anybody but themselves. And he nodded his head and he said, I'm glad that you understand that I have to enforce the law. You know? And they told him that they had a permit for doing what they were doing, which was a total lie. They don't give out permits in this town totally a lie. They lied to a police officer, lied to the law. Fine Christians and everything, of course. You know, and if he had known that, I think things would have been far different. I didn't know it at the time either, but I talked to the town office and she's like, they didn't have a permit. We don't give permits. <laughs> Another story. But the point is, a lot of people get an attitude towards police officers. And, you know, I see this thing. And, you know, of course there are bad police officers out there. I'm not saying that they're all wonderful you know, great men and stuff like this. But I'll tell you what, we are supposed to pray for those guys. We are supposed to support them. I mean, you're reading it right there in Romans chapter 13. That doesn't mean blind allegiance to the government and whatever, but those guys are facing some stuff out there. They're facing people that are on new levels of drugs, um, bath salts and, you know, all this synthetic marijuana and prescription drugs, good night. You know, these antidepressants and stuff, people just snapping and going crazy. And them guys are, they're, they're, you talk about lives on the line, you know, the police officers being killed by these Black Lives Matters people and stuff like this. I mean, those guys are facing a lot. So if you're a patriotic American, what are you going to do about that? Just say, well, I hope the law and order system, you know, the system of uh, law, you know, I hope it falls down, you know, or falls apart without rule of law, in other words. Uh, you don't want that. We don't want that. As Christians, we should be upholding that and saying, letting these police officers know, I as a Christian support you upholding proper law. And I support you coming out and, and to public disturbances and doing whatever that you're doing. Let them know. You know, the right thing to do is not to say, well, Christians are, you know, we'll stay away from the police and we'll just, you know, glare at them and stuff from afar. That's not it. That's not it at all. Um, I think it's very important uh, for Christians to just simply say, you know, I, I, I hope you will understand what I'm saying. I'm not, I, th I just think it's very important. I mean, you look in the book of Acts and you'll see Paul you know, befriending the centurion, the one uh, Roman soldier, you know, and, and he actually protects Paul. <laughs> you know, they're like, we're going to kill the prisoners. You know, at one point when the boat's going down, the boat's sinking there, later part of the book of Acts, and this one Roman soldier's like, no, and he actually protects Paul. These Roman soldiers were, you know, Paul was friendly to him. Paul was nice to him. You know, so um, as far as being patriotic, uh, I would say I would warn against the thing of like, I think we're going to bring America back. We're not going to bring America back. Not at all. But while we're here, it's our job to hinder the Antichrist movement, to hinder the New World Order and, and martial law and unconstitutional um, laws and, and bad things like that. I mean, if, if you're ever at the store or something, we'll say, and some pervert goes to walk into the bathroom and your wife and daughter are in there, make a stink about it. And the police come out and just say, Officer, are you? do you mean to tell me, sir? Be respectful to him and say, do you really mean to tell me that I have to let my wife and daughter be in danger because some guy thinks he's a woman all of a sudden? And if the police officer says, well, I just have to enforce the law. Say, is there a point in time when the law becomes corrupt, when it goes against common sense? I mean, if my wife gets raped by this guy that went in there, uh, are you going to say, well, that was his right or something? You know? Speak to them that way. Again, it's our duty. We do have somewhat of a patriotic duty there that you're reading about in Romans 13, 1 through 5. Well, actually 1 through 6. Um, we do have that patriotic duty. But as far as voting on the national level and stuff like that, it is, it is completely controlled. It is ridiculous. 
Uh, I believe your patriotic duty is to uh, try to uphold the law and try to do what you can do to um, support the police, the small local police in your area uh, to maintain law and order in, uh, in that area where you're at. Um, that would be my take on that. Um, as far as like running for office or something like that, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, there were Christians in the past that, that were in political office here in America. And uh, I mean, way in the past, 1800s, you know, and I think that that's fine and everything. But nowadays, eh, eh, <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, bad idea. Uh, the military, again, you know, I'll just kick the military while I'm at it here. Um, if you're in the military and you're a Christian, um, if the Lord hasn't shown you yet that you need to get out of that thing with all the politically correct laws and all the other junk that goes on and stuff. And, and I mean, you know, I, I used to be in ministry with a, a brother that, you know, Brother Jesse Dulesky. He was a sergeant in the Marine Corps, and he told me, you know, if you're a Marine, if you make the mistake of calling your weapon a gun, um, the things that you had to say, and uh, that's not the kind of things that can, should come out of the mouth of a Bible-believing Christian. I don't know if they do that in the Army or Navy or, or Air Force or anything, but I know in the Marine Corps... Uh, what are you saying? Not the Army. Not the Army, okay. Not when I, when you know, not yeah. My wife was in the Army and the Navy. She's, I asked her here. But, uh, you know, if you understand what I'm saying, the, the Marine Corps, they do a, a rather filthy thing when you say gun. You know, so... I mean, and, and just the fact that a lot of these DIs are like just screaming profanity in your face and then it's like don't ask, don't tell and, and uh, all this other stuff. You know, some soldier wants to, you know, have relations with an animal. Well, that's okay. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's absurd. You know, oh, I'm a Christian and I've been, I've been, you know, for 20 something years and I just, I think it's great and I'm going to continue in the military. Uh... uh and, and, you know, what's my patriotic duty? The military is not fighting for America. The military in, in this country is fighting for the Vatican. They're going on crusades. Enough on that. All right, next one. Dilly305, this is an honest question. How do we know that you aren't a Jesuit? It's a fair question. If they can deny each other, deny their own doctrines, is it ever possible to know for certain if someone is isn't a Jesuit. Okay, well, uh, what are the goals and purposes of the Jesuit order? Okay, um, the goals and, Je and, and purposes of the Jesuit order, uh, they will eventually get people back to those goals. They might temporarily act like, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm, you know, I'm for the King James Bible or I'm for this or whatever else, but they'll always try to get you back. What was the purpose of the Counter-Reformation? To get rid of the book. Okay, that's why the King James Bible, the authorized version there, authorized version, that's what it was originally called, came out in 1611, whereas uh, the Dewey Reims, the Jesuits, I mean, they came out with their own Bible in 1610. The New Testament was uh, 1582, the Reims New Testament. The Dewey Old Testament, which completed the thing, was 1610. So they were literally trying to offer their own version before the King James Bible came out. They made it to press, in other words. Ironic because they did the same thing with the NIV. Before the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible, the NIV comes out trying to steal the you know, limelight of the King James Bible. Look, brand new updated NIV, brand new updated NIV. On the 400th anniversary, right around that same time, I think they announced it in, in uh, 2010, you know, and then by 2011, that was, oh, the new NIV, yay, you know. <laughs> Just a coincidence, you know, it's ridiculous. And the guy that owns the NIV is a, is a papal knight, Rupert Murdoch. But um, how can you tell if somebody is a Jesuit? Well, the original intent of the Jesuit order was to bring all people back to Rome. So understand what the doctrines of Roman Catholicism are. They don't believe in the authority, the infallible authority of the King James Bible or any derivative thereof of any in other languages, the, king, the equivalents in foreign languages, in other words. They want to take people away from the authority of Scripture. Um, they want to get people to go against Israel. They want people to change the identity of Mystery Babylon. All right. Um, 
they are very hardcore against the what people call pre-trib rapture uh, because it just destroys Catholic doctrine. Um, there are so many different things that the Jesuits are against. Um, and if you see somebody that is exposing the Jesuits by name, I mean, if, if, if the Lord gave us the information, I'll just put this out there. If you're a Jesuit and you give us the list of all the members of your Jesuit order that are infiltrators of in the Bible-believing movement, we will bring out the names. We won't even sleep till the names are brought out. Okay, I will expose anybody in that system without any fear of well, what might happen to us or whatever. I will die for that cause. Okay, um, our hatred for the Jesuit order knows no bounds. We will fight them until the death. Um, how can I still be a Jesuit if I'm doing all these things? Uh, we are one of the few ministries um, that you know, regularly defends those who come out against the Catholic Church and against the Jesuit order in particular. Um, you look at people like uh, Stephen Anderson, you know, just happens to be against Jack Chick, who exposes the Jesuits, against Eric John Phelps, who exposes the Jesuits. And uh, you have Brian Moonan comes out, and he's a former Catholic. Wife works for the Department of Defense, which goes back to the Vatican, control of the military. And uh, he's former Catholic, and yet he's against um, the pre-trib rapture. And uh, he's messing around with the identity of Babylon. And, um, you know, it's absurd. So, again, uh, a lot of these people that are against Chick Publications um, and against Eric John Phelps. Oh, that was that was the other one. Uh, Brian Moonan came out very hard against Peter Ruckman and against um, Eric John Phelps. Called him racist. And of course, my wife and I as well. We're racist as well, too, apparently. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so, you know, the Jesuits might um, fake you out a little bit by looking like they're anti-Catholic, but they'll always steer you back towards Rome. That's the purpose. To make it all, to simplify everything that I'm trying to say, they will, you'll see a Jesuit might appear anti-Catholic, but they'll start steering you back towards it. They'll start steering you back towards replacement theology, towards post-trib rapturism, towards the new Bible versions, towards the changing the identity of Mystery Babylon, towards attacking and undermining the King James Bible. They'll do something to accomplish the purposes of their order. All right. Um, and when you see a ministry like ours that is just rabidly against all of those movements and it's never changed. I mean, I was exposing the Jesuits. I've been exposing them since being online. Um, I'm not a Jesuit. Okay. Um, but, it, but that's a fair question. I'm not at all offended by that. That that's, uh, shows actually um, some good sense. So thank you for your question. Okay, Caleb Daniel, next one. Many KJV critics will attack the KJV's rendering of 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. They say the, King, the KJV misses the deity of Jesus in this area. I could not disagree more. 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Given the rendering of Galatians 1.4, which is, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil ward, world, according to the will of God and our Father. I would respond that actually the KJV is stronger as it says Christ is God, not just our God. How would you scripturally respond? Um, well, you kind of did the work for me there. <laughs> I agree with you. You know, um, They do that in a couple places. I know I heard uh, uh, Dimbo White, uh, James White, oh, excuse me, or Jesuit White. I forget what his name is now. I'm joking there. Um, I remember he came out and he said something about uh, that he had this shocking time when they showed him that you know the, the King James Bible, some Mormon missionaries or somebody like this, uh, showed him that the King James Bible identified Jesus and God as two separate people. Uh, 2 Peter 1 verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like pre precious, precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. See, so they say there's two different ones. 
our Savior Jesus Christ and God are two totally different people. Uh, no. <laughs> um, you know, it'd be kind of like saying, um, uh, I um, fought under um, Dwight D. Eisenhower and the general, you know, and our general. You know, I fought under Douglas MacArthur and our general or something like that, you know, or the, the general of our military or something like this. It's the same guy, you know. And here you have, you know, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. God is our Savior Jesus Christ. He's God and our Savior. See? The wording of the King James Bible is very unique uh, because it's God's book. And that's why I get perturbed when I hear people saying, you know, it's not like our modern-day English. Why would you want it to be? It should be higher than our ways, than our thoughts. So, you know, I would say absolutely there's no contradiction there. There's no problem. So, but it's a good point, good way to defend the King James Bible. I think I got your question right there. Hopefully I did. Um, so, next one. Joel and Trista. I'm new to your videos, so forgive me if you've already addressed this. Do you believe in the millennial reign of Yeshua? He will set up a kingdom on earth for the thousand years after he returns. Er, after he returns, question mark. Um, well, I stick with the English rendering of the name of Jesus. I don't really use Yeshua. I think if somebody speaks Hebrew, that's fine to call him Yeshua because that's their native tongue, but I'm not a Jew, I'm, in spite of what some people think. Um, I'm, you know, German ancestry, and uh, I believe in my English King James Bible, and my King James Bible says Jesus. So again, if you're Jewish, call him Yeshua. If you're English speaking, call him Jesus. Um, that name has power. I've seen it. I've talked about that in other studies. But uh, will there be a thousand-year kingdom with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning? Well, the very simplest. I do have a study on the millennial kingdom of the premillennial coming of Jesus Christ. You can look that up. Go to my channel, the little search thing there. Type in premillennial. But uh, Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I souls of, saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. All right. Um, Jesus comes down to the earth in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 down through 21. All right, brings war against the, the beast and the false prophet and wipes them out. Then he wipes out their 200 million man army. But it doesn't say he goes back up again. Okay, Jesus Christ is there for the millennial kingdom. And there's plenty of other scriptures back in the Old Testament, prophecies about him setting up his kingdom. Again, listen to the premillennial study on that if you want more than that. So yes, I am definitely premillennial. Uh, there's no other system for a Bible-believing Christian. You have to be premillennial if you believe the King James Bible as it stands. All right, IMU70 says, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Is it true this verse is used for Satan Lucifer, who is adversary to our Lord? Some people deny that this word belongs to our Lord and has nothing to do with Satan. Thank you for your reply. Well, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 is definitely about the devil. I don't know how somebody could take that and point it towards the Lord. That's kind of weird. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Um, you know, how could it be the God of this world be um, the Lord? <laughs> Why would he blind their minds? and keep them from the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. So that doesn't make any sense. Anybody that would tell you that, I, I mean, this is another thing that's so weird about nowadays, because there's people coming out with some of the weirdest stuff, and I just go, how in the world did you even get that? Um, and I think a reason for that is because Christians used to mean, you know, being a Christian used to mean something. I mean, you didn't just call yourself a Christian 50, 60 years ago. Uh, you know, it, it meant something. Now there's, because of the heresies of easy believism and lordship salvation, 
there are so many false converts in professing Christianity. That's why you're seeing so many heresies and just weird things that people are coming up with. I mean, just read the verse there. It's a lowercase g, God of this world. You know, Satan is the one who's blinding the minds of these people. So, um, you know, it is it is definitely about the devil, to answer your question. Next we have Chris Milby. What is the proper way to fast, both physically and spiritually speaking? Thanks. Um, well, I don't really know that there is a proper way in terms of a actual formula um, to fast. I mean, you can just read through the New Testament and look at the way different people fasted. Um, uh, let's see here. Okay, I was looking over at Second Corinthians chapter six, verses four down through ten. Uh, it doesn't say anything about in fastings often, um, but Paul does talk about fasting. So it's not just well, it's in um, the Gospels before Jesus dies on the cross. We don't have to do it now. No, it's it's still here. <clears throat> okay, Second Corinthians chapter eleven is where it's at. Second Corinthians eleven, um, verse twenty-seven says, "In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness." Talking about the perils that he went through as a you know minister of the Lord. Um, notice fastings is not they just didn't have food. Because it says there, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often. All right, so their fasting is still here. It's still a very powerful thing to do. Is there a prescribed thing of, you know, well, you're supposed to do it three days or whatever else? Uh, no, no, there's nothing like that. Uh, I don't believe that there's any specific um, formula or whatever. I think uh, some of these people try to do what Jesus did going out 40 days and 40 nights, you know, to be tempted of the devil in the wilderness and fasting that time, that's very, very dangerous to try to do that. I mean, you're talking about God manifest in the flesh there. So um, the proper way to fast is, you know, there are different types of fasts. I mean, you can skip one meal and use that time to pray. You can go for a day without eating. Um, you know, the, the whole point is of fasting that you're putting down your flesh and saying, hey, instead of you getting food, I'm going to actually use that time to pray instead. And that's very powerful. It shows the Lord that you're serious about what you're trying to pray for. So that's my answer to that one. Ralphus9999. Tim LaHaye Prophecy Study Bible. It is or is not correct with the gospel. If you have any comment or suggestions, please thank you, Ralph. Um, I don't have one of the Tim LaHaye Prophecy Study Bibles, so I really can't help you there as far as if, if it's correct or not with the gospel. Um, I actually heard that Tim LaHaye is dead now. He's, he's uh, passed away. And um, I have a number of problems with the guy. Um, his Left Behind series was very, very, very bad. Uh, there was a lot of different things that he put in there. He actually had people in the time of Jacob's trouble seeing crosses on each other's forehead. Total lie. Uh, the, those that are sealed in their forehead are the 144,000 Jews, not just average Christians. So that's a dangerous thing, um, especially because the, the Bible says there in Revelation 20, what we looked at just a little bit ago, that people have a mark upon their foreheads. So I do believe that there's an implantable microchip. You know, That's why it's in the right hand or in the forehead. But there's also an upon there, something physically visible there. And Tim LaHaye is telling people to look, you know, in his books, they're looking and they're seeing crosses that only Christians can see. Also, there are no Christians in the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, they're not called Christians. They're not part of the body of Christ. That's another dangerous thing. Um, also, he had people taking the mark and still being saved. Uh, John MacArthur is doing that. A lot of these big teachers are starting to come out and say, yeah, I think you can take the mark. Just absolutely the height of Satanism and evil. Just really, really, really bad. So uh, I don't really know what Tim LaHaye taught for salvation in his prophecy study Bible, but I'm very uh, 
very leery of the man taking anything from him. All right. TRV357 says, Greetings, brother. Flat Earth. Would like your thoughts, brother Brian. Joshua 10:12. Would Joshua not have asked the Earth to stop, not the sun and moon, if the Earth revolved around the sun? Earth cannot be moved. Um, Psalm 9610, Psalm 931, molten glass sky in Job 3718, pillars the earth sets upon Job 96, Psalm 104, verse 3, and 1 Samuel 28, Tower of Babel trying to reach the dome, Genesis 11, 1 through 9, waters above the firmament, Genesis 1, 6, and 7. Up until a few hundred years ago, the earth, flat earth was taught for thousands of years, even in the time when the Lord Jesus was walking on the earth. The flat earth destroys Darwinianism and evolution and little green men from the other planets, which the Bible does not mention. Uh, I don't know how that would be. How does a flat earth destroy evolution? That's kind of a new one. I haven't heard that one. Thank you for your time, Brother Brian. God bless you and your household. There's your brother in Jesus. That is a very detailed study on this. Um, he is on YouTube under Russ, Russin Vids. Will be worth your time. Um, the videos that I've seen on this whole flat earth thing are primarily um, New Agers. And there's even some uh, ties to the Catholic Church and Jesuitry with this whole flat earth thing. Um, one of the big guys on it, uh, Rob Skiba or something like this, I think his name is, he's a post-tribber, militant post-tribber, heretic. So, you know, some of the big guys that are coming out with all these questions on the flat earth thing, they're heretics. So I don't mess with it. Honestly, to me, it's a, it's a divers and strange doctrine. Let me give you the scripture on that. Because um, I think this is a very important thing. Okay, I quoted that wrong. Uh, let's see here. Hebrews 13, verse 9. You can turn your Bible there to Hebrews 13, verse 9. This is one you want to highlight because this is a warning that I think is very, very true. Um, good advice for any dispensation. I do teach that the book of Hebrews is primarily pointed at the uh, time of Jacob's trouble saints, but there is, you know, all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable, profitable for doctrine, for reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All right, and uh, this is definitely one that's a good instruction in righteousness. Hebrews 13, 9 says, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. All right, so uh, I would say that the gap theory, geocentricity, and flat earth are all divers and strange doctrines, and they aren't going to profit you. Okay, that's not going to prove one thing or another. Flat Earth does not disprove evolution. Okay, um, not going to happen. So, my answer. All right, country Hefa. Okay, she says here, when Jesus turned water to wine, is it grape juice? What exactly is it? Some people feel it's okay to drink wine, and they use that as excuse. Okay, well, um, you know, uh, was it grape juice? Well, you know, um, I think the miracle there would have been that the Lord could have made fermented wine, okay, um, instantly. Uh, just turning water into grape juice, uh, would that have been a miracle? Well, yeah, it would have definitely been a miracle, but it would have been an even greater miracle to age it uh, just instantly, like that. Um, was it intended? And of course, you have the guy there, and he's like, you know, um, well, let, let's go to the actual passage there. I'll show you another reason why I think it was probably very mildly fermented. Um, you know, there's um, like apple cider and things. You can you can mildly ferment apple cider, and it's not going to make you drunk. It just has a little bit of a bitiness to it. Okay, um, I'll talk more about that here in a minute. Um, John chapter 2, verse 9 says, When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, 
the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou, thou hast kept the good wine until now. Okay? So, in other words, they're, you know, uh, they're drinking this, this wine, and after a while they're not able to really to discern, you know, I guess because it's in their taste buds or whatever else. I don't believe that they were uh, getting just totally wasted drunk or anything like that. Um, there's a lot of cultures around that uh, you can, that they socially drink. They drink alcoholic beverages, but it's never to get drunk. It's never just to lose control of yourself. It's, they'll sip it or whatever else. And there's, this is a huge subject. I mean, there's, there's a difference too between synthetic and natural alcohols. Okay. A natural alcohol is where you take things from nature, like barley for beer or wheat, um, and you ferment it. You put yeast with it and it ferments. Um, fermented grain, fermented food, uh, wine, it, if it's a low fermentation, it's actually good for you. That's why Paul wrote to Timothy and told him that he should use a little wine for his often infirmities, thy stomach sake and thy often infirmities. Um, fermented foods are good for you. Uh, if you take cabbage and slice it thin into little shreds, and stick it into a crock pot, you know, a crock, not one that you plug into the wall, but you know, a crock, a ceramic container with a lid on it, and put salt on that uh, cabbage, that shredded cabbage, and then put a little bit more cabbage, more salt, more, you know, like that, uh, that will ferment in there and it'll turn into sauerkraut. And that cabbage goes from a very mild cabbagey type of flavor to now being somewhat tart and having a bit of a little bit of a bite to it, uh, somewhat almost like carbonated taste to it, if you will. Why? Because it's fermented. It has good bacteria in it. Um, that's why yogurt, that's, again, yogurt is fermented dairy products. Uh, kefir uh, is another good thing, a Russian drink where they take bacteria and they put bacteria into um, basically milk, raw milk, and then they, the bacteria grows in there and it'll have somewhat of a carbonated flavor. It's like drinking um, a flavored yogurt drink with a little bit of carbonation to it. It's actually very good. It's very, very good for you, exceptionally good for you to have that in there because your, your gut, your, your stomach and things need that healthy bacteria, bacteria flora in there to digest food, okay? And um, that's why uh, pasteurized milk is not very good for you because what they're doing is they, they cook it and it kills the bacteria. You say, well, that's a good thing. Yeah, but they don't strain out the bacteria. So you're drinking white liquid with dead bacteria floating all through it. Uh, raw milk is very, very good for you. Again, um, fermented things, raw things that have that natural good bacteria in them are not bad for you. And if you understand anything at all about the Jewish way of making wine, you can look that up and they will actually take the clusters and they will, they will squeeze them. Some of them do it by hand. Some of them will have a, a juice type of a press and they want to make it as raw as possible and kosher, you know, clean and things like that. So um, I believe that Jesus uh, created wine that had a little bit of aging to it but not so much that it would have made them drunk because that would have caused him to sin. I mean, if he's getting people drunk, I don't think he could say that he was sinless. So, um, but that passage in no way gives a um, blessing to people with drunkenness. So, you know, anybody that says, well, you know, we can get drunk off that passage. No, you can't. No, you can't. So, um, but let's continue. David Mark Terrell. Hello, Brother Brian. I want to become a missionary in Japan since the vast majority of Japanese are lost. My questions are, is being a missionary a good way to serve the Lord? What are the best ways to serve the Lord? I've been saved for nearly a year, and I just want to serve the Lord with my life. If it isn't the Lord's will for me to go there, um, then I will make videos preaching the gospel to them. Thank you for all your hard work for the body of Christ, brother. Your sis you, Sister Catherine, little brother Oliver, are always in my prayers. God bless you and the ministry. 
Thank you. Um, is it a good idea to be a missionary to Japan? Uh, well, uh, I would say certainly if the Lord calls you there. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, the thing of a missionary, um, a lot of missionaries, you know, they'd be better, better called moochinaries. And what they're actually doing is they're going and uh, I'll just give you a story. I've been, I was in, on different mission trips and things to other countries um, back before I got saved, actually. Another story. But uh, we would go down there and these missionaries, moochinaries, you know, they're getting funded from America. So they're, they have all this financial backing. So they go down there and they can live like kings and queens because houses are cheap. The people don't have barely any money at all. So they're coming in with, you know, thousands of dollars a month in, in support from America. And uh, I actually knew some of these missionaries and they were living up on in the hill countryside and stuff in Honduras and they had big huge houses and they were using the, no, the native local people for servants. I mean literally. And they had this one woman, uh, the Parker family, it was the family I'd, I'd stayed with for a little bit and they had a Honduran native woman named Gina and she would cook the meal and then she would stand there while everybody ate, everybody else ate the meal or she'd eat in another room standing up you know she was too you know she couldn't come and sit with the wealthy white missionaries and you know and then they'd say well we try to get her to sit and stuff but it's not their culture and what are you doing there getting servants and stuff like this i mean come on so it, uh the missionary thing a lot of times these missionaries are going and they're saying we're going to bring american uh, multiculturalism into these countries um, it's wicked that's not what the Lord intended you read through the book of Acts Paul's not going and bringing his Jewish culture on to other people he's given them the gospel of Jesus Christ and he's training up those young men to go to their own people so uh, you know I would say if you're uh, going to go to Japan um, I don't I mean, I don't know. I can't tell by your name if you're uh, Japanese or anything. I don't know what your what your uh, nationality is. But if you're not Japanese, then I would say there's nothing wrong with going to Japan. But don't take your culture and try to make them like your culture. Train up the na native people, and when there's enough there that they can train their own people, leave. Okay, Paul didn't say, I'm just going to retire over in Spain or something like this. No, no. He went on missionary journeys, but it was a temporary thing. All right. Um, I think missionary work is a very noble, honorable thing, but it's been so corrupted now. Uh, most countries are not very welcoming of American missionaries anymore because uh, they've just seen the multiculturalism thing of it all. They've seen that it's, they see it more of American global expansion. They don't really see it as a, hey, these people are here to give us the gospel. Oh, oh you bring in the white man's religion. Okay, what are you going to do? Look for oil here and then come bomb our country or something? You know, That's what they see. So pray about it. Um, okay. Uh, Antonia Alvarez. Brother Brian, I am a housewife married to an unsaved husband. We are still raising his 28-year-old alcoholic son. He does not work. He lives in our house. We clothe him, feed him, wash his clothes, yes, even that, provide his drinks, or give him $15 a day for him to buy alcohol himself. My husband accuses me of being a merciless Christian because I do not want to help him. I resent any help I provide for him, but I do it to please my husband. Does the Bible condemn my behavior? Uh, well, again, you have this situation where a wife is to submit to her husband, but not when your husband is disobeying the Lord. Um, we are all going to be held accountable. Uh, we're all going to stand before the for the Lord someday. I'll give you a verse on that. Um, let me just look it up here quick. I have it written down. Okay, Romans 14. No, that's not the one I was looking for. Um, 1 Corinthians 3. That might be the one I'm looking for. The thing about the judgment seat of Christ. 
getting there. Okay, that's not the one either. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians five ten says, um, "We from we, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad." Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Okay, and it goes on to say some more things, but we won't read it for sake of time. Um, we are serving a God as saved people that is going to be doing some very terrible things in the future to the lost world. And you have to keep that in mind. And uh, I would say in this situation here, um, your husband needs to understand that by continuing to allow him to be there and uh, continuing to um, pay for his sin, um, you're pretty much guaranteeing him a place in hell. And uh, that's not right. And um, I think that that's something that you need to pray very, very hard about. Uh, you know, as a, as a woman, you don't want to usurp your husband's authority, but at the same time, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, if he's an unsaved man, um, again, uh, I'll show you another verse on that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, verse 13 says, And the woman which hath an, un, an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Uh, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. You're not bound to a lost husband as a saved woman. If things get so bad that he will not serve the Lord, he will not submit, he will not get saved, then you have every right to leave him, according to the Scriptures, right there. Okay? Um, and as far as your children being holy, it's not talking about fully grown children that are able to make their own decisions. They're not under some special thing there because they have a saved mother. Um, that's a situation... Uh, definitely where uh, I think a wife would, you know, a saved wife would do well to just simply say, hey, you know, something has to change here. So um, without knowing more about the situation, I can't really say a whole lot more on that one. But uh, definitely I think it's important to, to really pray hard about that one and what the Lord would have you do. Um, next we have ABC Christian 2 resurrected bodies question I'm wondering how will our appearance look are we going to take on the appearance of how we looked when we died or the appearance of when we were young because if we take on a young appearance how will, how will we be able to recognize someone like our grandmas or grandpas if we only knew them as being old also since our New resurrected bodies will be immortal. If someone born in the 1,000-year millennial reign tried to physically attack our resurrected bodies, it wouldn't, be po it wouldn't be possible for them to kill us. I sometimes wonder how damage to our resurrected bodies would be prevented. Uh, it would be nice to hear what your thoughts are on this, too. Um, okay, well, actually, if you go back to the book of Joel, I'll show you this thing about uh, the resurrection body. I believe that this is a reference to the army that comes back. Um, the, us as Christians, okay, when, when after the time of Jacob's trouble, the body of Christ comes down in Revelation 19, and then we're actually sent out to gather the nations to bring them to judgment, uh, the judgment of the nations in Matthew chapter 25. And I think that this is a reference to this. Joel chapter 2, um, and you get down through there, uh, but we'll look at verse 8 of Joel chapter 2. It says, Here neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. So yeah, it, it lines up with what you're saying there. 
um, we will be immortal. And so uh, you could fall on a sword, you could be shot at, whatever else, and it's not going to injure you. And um, there's a theory, which uh, is a very interesting theory. It gets really deep into some different scriptures and stuff. Uh, the Bible plainly teaches that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Okay, um, There's prohibitions against drinking blood and eating blood in, uh, before the law, under the law, after the law. In the book of Acts, chapter 15, after the law. So it's there for us today. Um, there's a thing, a special thing there about blood. Um, and the theory is that in the resurrection, we're not going to have blood because life of the flesh is in the blood, you know. And uh, so if that's true, you could be shot or stabbed and you're not going to bleed to death. It would just basically go through and probably just close right back up again. Uh, How does that all work? Well, I don't know exactly. And, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of scriptures we could get into with this. I've talked about this in other studies. But uh, I'll show you the verse as far as what are we going to look like. Uh, let's see where are we at here. First John chapter 3, verse 3. And again, I've talked about this in some other studies. I forget which one it was exactly, but some of my older sermons I've talked about this in greater detail. But 1 John chapter 3, um, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. You get saved, you don't just get your immortal body. But we know that when he shall appear... Jesus, in other words, when Jesus shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Uh, there's another verse that talks about we are going to be conformed to the image of Christ. So, in the resurrection, Jesus said we're neither, uh, we, they neither uh, marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. The angels of, of God in the Old Testament were called the sons of God. But here in this passage it says, Now are we the sons of God. Revelation chapter 5, I believe it is, there's a great multitude of angels that are there. So I believe, and I have taught this for many years, that in the resurrection we're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. In other words, all male. In the resurrection they are as the angels of God in heaven. All right? Uh, and again, you know, women say, what? You know, there won't be any women in heaven? Well, you're going to be there. It's just you're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I mean, the Bible says that a wife is to be submissive to her husband. Is that going to be forever? You know, a wife goes up to, to be with the Lord and things. She's going to be a wife cooking and cleaning in the house or something like this. Keep her at home forever. You know, uh, how does that all work out? I don't know. I just go with what the Bible teaches. Okay. I'm bound to this book. So, um, I believe in the resurrection that, uh, yes, we cannot be injured. Uh, we will have an immortal body that probably doesn't bleed, so you can get hit by a sword or, or shot at or whatever else, and it, it wouldn't do a thing to you. Secondly, I believe that we're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We're going to look like Christ. That's how I would answer that one. All right. MLB Grubs 3. Hey, Brian, this is not three questions. Please read it. Uh, it's one quick question. I've done a lot of research on the KJV. I want to believe it is the perfect Word of God. There's only three sections of the KJV Bible that are in the way of that. I was wondering if you could explain them to me and other believers. Uh, okay, well, you know, if you come to the point of, or of believing that the King James Bible is God's perfect Word, it's going to be by faith. Okay. That's important to understand. Number one, the KJV says, says God repented several times in the Old Testament. I believe God is perfect and never needed to repent. Well, what's the context of the word repent? Repenting means changing your mind. It can mean other things. Turning from sin, changing your mind. It depends on the context in which it appears. Okay. Obviously, when God repented, He is not saying that I'm a sinner, I need to repent. He's simply saying I'm changing my mind about that judgment that I was going to bring. All right, so you look up the word repentance 
it's it's defined by the context in which it appears. Not a problem with the King James Bible. Number two, Hebrews 4.8 uses the name Jesus when I've heard the correct translation is Joshua. Okay, now there's a big study on that whole thing there. Um, the word is definitely Jesus. You know, and to, to call it Joshua, we'll, we'll go there real quick. Um, I don't have that whole thing members, memorized, but it says here, Hebrews 4, 8, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? And they say, no, it's actually Joshua. Okay, was Joshua in control of giving them rest? Or was it the Lord working through Joshua? You see? The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the firstborn of every creature and that by him all things consist. Everything is tied back to the Lord Jesus Christ. He controls everything. He speaks through whoever he wants to speak through. So when they're given rest there in the Old Testament, it's Jesus Christ working through Joshua. So it was Jesus that gave him rest, not Joshua. All right? And uh, finally, we have number three. Micah 4.2 says, Son of righteousness. Shouldn't it say, Son? Hope you can answer. I would love to use, only use KJV. Love your ministry. Well, you're going to have to get to that point. Um, look at the options. Okay? King James Bible's it. But what about the thing of the Son of Righteousness? Shouldn't it say S-O-N, Son? No. Again, if you do a study on this whole thing, um, when does the Son show up in Genesis chapter 1? The fourth day. Um, when does Jesus Christ show up on the earth? Approximately... 4,000 years after the creation, approximately. Um, what does it say over in 2 Peter chapter 3? One day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Hmm. So on day four, day, one day is as a thousand years. Day four, the S-U-N shows up. On the 4,000th year, the S-O-N shows up. There's a really interesting study you can get into if you look at the sun. Um, the church is given, is typified as the moon in some places. What is the moon? The moon has no light of its own. It reflects the light of the sun. And there's all kinds of stuff that you can get into with this whole thing of the sun. So no, it's not a mistake in Micah 4.2. It's actually an advanced revelation. It's really neat stuff when you actually compare these things. Uh... Dan ben Benu, why doesn't Paul ever warn us about the mark of the beast in his letters? Because we won't be here, you know, for the mark of the beast. Just like this, Bino 60815 says there, uh, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I mean, you have major problems doctrinally if you teach that Christians are going to be here for the time of Jacob's trouble and take the mark of the beast. Um, be a real big problem. So that's how I would answer that. Uh, let's see. Um, Chippy the Chipmunk. Would you please address the so-called Hebrew Roots movement where professing Christians seem to be following the Torah and have changed Jesus to Ye Yeshua, the Father to YHWH. Apparently there's a Bible called the Hallelujah Scriptures that claims to be a superior version because they claim it's some kind of Paleo-Hebrew name scripture. For example, example, I think they claim the letter J did not exist 2,000 years ago. So they've changed uh, Jesus to Yeshua and or ya, Yahshua or Yeshua. However, how do they explain the literal, literally hundreds of other names, places in the King James Version that are spelled with a J? I think that is important because a lot of channels have completely dropped using the name Jesus. Um, you know, uh, there are certain languages, for instance, the German languages, language, uh, they don't pronounce J, they pronounce it as a Y. Okay, um, there's, I think that the Spanish language will pronounce a J like an H sometimes. So uh, to say, you know, in Hebrew, of course, the, the J's are pronounced like Y's. It's very similar to German, the German language. So to say somehow that, uh, you know, um, the, the, 
you know, J has never been right and whatever else. No, it's an English word. Okay, it's perfectly fine and acceptable to use the name of Jesus. Okay, and uh, there have been other peoples that have that have done the thing of the Hebrew roots thing and whatever, d debunking that. I have done a video. I think it's. Let me just check here real quickly. Okay, I have uh, FAQ 96, Yahweh or Jehovah. Um, what about Michael Root and the Hebrew Roots Movement? I've done a couple things on that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can look up some of my videos on that whole thing of the Hebrew Roots Movement. Uh, so, you know, d just watch out for that whole you know, ridiculous nonsense of them taking away the name of Jesus. Talked about that in other studies. Okay, in season out. I often witness to the message of the hour cult. They believe Jesus was created and deny the Trinity, etc. Concerning the Godhead Trinity, I know Jesus is the image of God, Colossians 1, 15 through 18, and God is a spirit, but he also has blood, Acts 20, 28. I know there are multiple Old Testament Old Testament appearances of Jesus, the angel of the Lord, captain of the Lord's host, Melchizedek, the son of God in Daniel 3.25. So are those, are these Old Testament appearances of Jesus the same body as in the New Testament, since Jesus was begotten, not created? Isaiah 59.1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. Is this Jesus as the image of God, or is this, the, or is this anthropomorph, anthropomorphism? Attributing man like characteristics to God. God is a spirit. John 4 24. Thanks for your help. Sorry, that was kind of two questions. Well, I'll forgive you this time, but, uh, um, you know, uh, as far as that whole thing is concerned, I do believe that Jesus Christ um, looked differently um, as far as the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Um, again, you know, we're getting into this thing of questions about the Godhead and questions about how does this work and how does that work. Great is the mystery of godliness. Okay, um, give you that verse here really quickly. I've quoted it a couple times and I don't think I've given the reference to it. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, uh, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The verse starts with end. I'm sorry. I, missed that, but um, the mystery of godliness is great. You're not going to understand uh, a lot of the points and, and things about the Lord. So I would just simply say, you know, that uh, a lot of those questions I don't, I can't point you to exact scriptures to say what did he look like in the Old Testament or things like this. Um, did he look, you know, I mean, we really don't even know what he looked like in the New Testament in terms of his actual physical appearance. Um, we don't really know. So, uh, you know, and as far as, uh, you know, what about the Lord, you know, having, you know, what about his hand and stuff like this isn't, isn't the Lord's spirit? Well, the Lord is, you know, I, I believe that the thing, the way that the Godhead works out is that in Jesus Christ dwells the, you know, let me get the scripture on that. The Godhead bodily. I'm trying to make sure I got this. Uh, Colossians 2, 9, For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay, talking about Jesus Christ. Um, in other words, Jesus Christ is the flesh. He's the body. God is the soul and the Holy Ghost is the spirit. So that is the Godhead. Now he can separate himself and he can be in heaven on earth at the same time and things like this. Um, you know, Jesus said at one point, you know, that his disciples come to him and they say, you know, show us the Father. And Jesus is like, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. You know, why? Well, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You know, Colossians 2 9. So, um, that's a lot of the stuff that we're just going to have to take by faith. You know, it's hard to understand all those things. But uh, we can understand that Jesus died for sinners. And we're sinners and we need a Savior. 
So uh, I do believe that you can speak of God, physical attributes of God's hands or whatever else, even though he's technically the soul of the Godhead. But the body is Jesus. Jesus is God. AB 1611 Bible Believer. Um, I'm a bit confused about tribulation and salvation. My understanding that it is a faith plus work system, but Edward Fenninger says that it's not possible because of Romans 11, 6. Your thoughts. Edward uh, Fenninger, I call him Fakinger, um, he's a total false prophet. The guy's got mental problems. Sorry, but he does. I mean, he just, he's kooky. I saw that stuff years and years ago, and I just kind of have tried to have grace for the guy and whatever else. But he's a nut. He's probably going to make a video of this now, too. Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Okay. Um, how does that prove uh, as far as, uh, you know, my understanding is that faith works system, but Edward Finninger says it's not possible because of Romans 11, 6. Your thoughts? Well, Romans chapter 11 is written to people in the church age. It's not written for the people in the time of Jacob's trouble. And if you read uh, James chapter 2, um, James chapter 2, verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Well, today, yes. But in the, in the time of Jacob's trouble, no. Faith is not going to save a man solely by itself in the time of Jacob's trouble. There's faith and works involved there. Um, you know, verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Verse 24, You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. You know, verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, why are these things being written to the twelve tribes? And that's what it's, who it's written to. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So, why are these things being written to the twelve tribes, the twelve tribes which show up in Revelation 7? But right now, there's neither Jew nor Greek. The twelve tribes are not here right now. Well, because the mark of the beast is going to be there. Revelation 14, verse 12 says, Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Two things. Okay. So, uh, Edward Fenninger, I wouldn't follow him across the street. Okay. That guy is a false prophet. Um, very, very, very wicked man. He just, you don't even have to pray to get saved now anymore. You just, you know, believe. You just start saying, oh, I believe I'm a Christian. And if you preach that uh, salvation is um, by grace through faith and you come to the Lord for salvation and you get saved, then you're not to teach that you're, there's to be a change in your life. You're not to, to go against sin. You can make playlists of, of secular sports with profanity in them, and that's good for Christians to watch. But if you condemn that stuff, well, then you're just, you know, you're teaching lordship salvation or something like this. The guy's a total complete heretic. So uh, please don't listen to Edward Fenninger. He's a total fraud. All right. KJV defense. Why does James 2.24 say, you say that, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only because this was written during the dispensation of grace, grace by faith alone without works. No, it wasn't. Even though it is written to a people in a different dispensation, why wasn't it considered heresy back in the first century? Because the whole Bible was not written for uh, people in the first century. There would have been parts of the Bible that are written for out into the future. Obviously, nobody considered it heresy, the, the things in Revelation 13 about the mark of the beast, even though the mark of the beast was not even you know, close to being around back in the first century. So... Uh, no, you know, it's James, the book of James is written to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad. So a lot of that stuff, you know, there, there's things in the New Testament that we're not going to understand. I mean, let's just, let's face that. Let's not be, you know, cocky and say, well, we can figure the whole thing out. Uh, I'm not about to say that. I know better. Uh, let's see. 
I'm trying to see here where we at here, Elton Play. That's a big discussion. Okay. I don't think I'm going to be able to. Uh, where do I go here? Okay. I'm not going to be able to do them all tonight, so it's going to take me into tomorrow or whenever I can get back to this again. But I'll I'll answer two more here. Elton Pillay, hi brother Brian. Will God save anyone who has never heard the gospel, i.e., can a person who has not been preached to before has not heard about salvation and has not accepted the gospel still go to heaven if God chooses to? I only ask this question because this seems to be common belief in the Christian world these days. Thank you for answering my question. Well, I don't believe that they can. I believe that uh, <clears throat> somebody can is not going to go to heaven unless they've heard the gospel. Um, you know, there is the passage here in Romans. Uh, let's see where it's at here. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me look it up quick. Yeah, I just want to encourage you out there uh, if you're like struggling with understanding scripture and thinking of where references are and things like this um, it'll get easier as time goes by I mean when I first got saved I couldn't turn to anything in scripture and now I can quote scripture pretty well but I still have to rely on looking things up occasionally um, it gets better with time um, Romans chapter 2 verse 14 says, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Um, so everybody has the law of God written in their hearts. Um, that doesn't guarantee automatic salvation if they're following those laws in their hearts. And there's debate there back and forth. Well, if they have never heard the gospel, but they're following the law in their heart and seeking after God, and they die that way, are they saved and things? And some people say yes. Some people say no. They have to hear the gospel and whatever. Um, you know, again, you have to understand God's ways are higher than ours. So God can look at a whole kindred of people, whole generations and generations and generations of people and just say, well, they're lost. Can we understand that? No. But, I mean, what did he do in the Old Testament? I mean, God damned a lot of people to hell, and there was no gospel for them. Uh, well, does God do the same thing today? You know, I would say very few people in this world don't have access to the gospel somehow. Um, I think if they really want to get saved, if they really have a desire to follow that, God-given conscience, the law that's written in their heart, I think the Lord's going to lead them to salvation through hearing the gospel. All right. Um, okay, I see this question. Next we have Utah Strong. Does God give us signs in the sky during the last days? And then they say, I forgot to say thank you and God bless. Thank you. Um, let me look up the scripture. Oops. Okay, Luke chapter 21. Will there be, does God give us signs in the sky during the last days? Well, Luke chapter 21, verse 25. 
And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And of course that's at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. But uh, before that, yes, there are, I think, tremendous signs in the heavens and we're seeing some of that stuff now. Oh, very, very weird weather. Um, some really weird stuff going on in the in the in the sky, and um, weird signs and stuff like this. I don't, I've never really gotten into the whole blood moon thing and the and the eclipses and the lunar this and the lunar that and stuff. Uh, you know, th th that stuff is shaky to me, and so I just kind of say, well, you know, I don't know, but um, that stuff is definitely coming in the time of Jacob's trouble, and. You know, as we get closer to the rapture, the body of Christ being called out before that time, we're going to start to see some of that stuff out there on the horizon. We're going to start to see some of these fearful signs in the heavens. So I would definitely say that, yes, uh, we will see some of that stuff, and we're going to be called up at some point in time. And, of course, the sign that we're looking for is found in Revelation chapter 4. He looks up into heaven, and he sees a door open, and he hears his name, and we go up. So that's the sign in heaven that we're looking for as Christians. So, uh, but an interesting question. So that is going to be it for now. I will get back to this uh, when I can answer the rest of these questions. So thank you very much for watching.